We just got a little bit of technical uh, fiddling around, so... Oh, it's not that bad, is it? <laughs> that complicated. There we go. Great, so I've got 30 minutes. I'm gonna rush through a lot of things, unfortunately, but uh, I'll just, uh, just talk about when I've been what you could loosely call curating, and uh, I think a lot of artists really start off by, and almost end by curating their own careers. They become curators of what they've done. This is no, I'm no exception to that really, because I've, uh, this is the first show I can happily show you the work from that I ever made, in the sense that before this I did shows, but you'll never see the work from it, because I don't want you to see it in a way. It's kind of embarrassing. But this is the first time I feel I was making work that uh, is acceptable, almost. Um, and I curated this show. I, I, my parents, I lived with my parents till I was 31, and they went on holiday for two weeks uh, to Hungary, and I think it was, and I had the idea of uh, putting on an exhibition in the house after they'd left. And I took down the art they'd bought at the Royal Academy or places like that, and I put up my own work. So I sort of hijacked the family home and, and took over most of the house. This is the bedroom. This is my bedroom, where I did a series of paintings about the life of Keith Moon. It was like a kind of Stations of the Cross, really, about his life. Um, let me see if I can get the next slide. There we go. I even did stuff in the toilet. Uh, this is uh, clearly the toilet. And on the walls, you can see these pieces of paper. And that is uh, graffiti from the men's toilets at the British Library, which at that point was quite an exclusive library uh, in the center of the British Museum. And the graffiti on the walls was very learned, but also incredibly filthy and pornographic at the same time. So you have this mixture of intellectual debate and discussion with word games and uh, people posing philosophical questions, but also a lot of very pornographic uh, writing about women, about philosoph philosophers, what they'd like to do with certain philosophers and so on. And so it's this incredible toing and froing of sexually frustrated males, uh, which was very, very funny indeed. And so I just transposed this graffiti, I wrote it down in a book, and then I made it into a book. And each chapter was a different stall in the toilets, in the men's toilets. And uh, that was in the toilet, obviously. A few years later, my mother saw this photograph in a book and was horrified that I'd kept the seat up on the toilet. <laughs> that was the worst part for her. Not that I'd taken over the house and done an exhibition in their absence, but because I'd left the seat up. Okay, so it's that one. I'm just getting used to these buttons. Um, so, I mean, this happened again, though. I sort of kept curating myself. Um, I curated myself in Venice, really. Wow. What has that image done? Oh, there we go. I won't touch anything, basically. So I curated my, my pavilion. I was left to my own devices by the British Council and given assistance, but basically it was a self-curated exhibition. In a way... It puts a lot of pressure on you, but it's actually much better for, for you in a way. But also, if it's a, if it's a disaster, then it's all your own fault. It's no, you have no one else to blame. You don't even have a curator to blame, which is a pity. But luckily for me, personally, I don't think it did. But I, I wanted to put on an exhibition that was a sense of, in, in a way, it was like a museum. It was a, uh, in the way that the best museums are these sort of time-traveling experiences. I wanted different eras. I wanted the past, the present, and the future to coincide with this great mix of uh, objects. So, for example, that, that image I showed you, they, these are prehistoric uh, flints from, from arrowheads. They're arrowheads. Some of them may be up to about 500,000 years old. Some of them made three weeks ago, probably, as fakes. But I, it wasn't clear what was what, really. I just bought them, a lot of them at auctions and also online. And they were throughout the whole main space. They were articulating the architecture, but also they were, they were going around objects, and I wanted them, to, in a way, to, to, to make these objects that are actually incredibly old, but not particularly valuable, weirdly. These things can be bought very easily, and they're not expensive to buy. They worked out at about a euro or two euros each, on average, to buy. Um, 
I wanted them interacting with, with some of the objects. So here we have something that could look like uh, a Bronze Age shield almost, and, but actually is a piece of redundant technology now. 30 years ago, that would have been a very high-tech thing, these three metal discs. They're actually the master discs for a record I made, but I thought they had such a great quality to them. So, still looking futuristic, but also, like I said, redundant really. They're not, they're not real pieces of technology anymore. I had the, had the arrowheads going around them. So with my pavilion, I was trying to mix up time zones and ideas through time zones to the point where, this, where the picture, the picture on the back wall, the painting, it's a huge painting. It's about seven by six meters of a, of a, of a bird carrying a, a Range Rover. It was meant to be some sort of neo-mythology about Britain. So I was looking at Britain in a myth mythological way. But it's, like I said, this is a piece of self-curation. Um, the first curated project I did was in Cardiff, in Wales, where I curated an exhibition through the eyes of four teenage boys who were a band called the Manic Street Preachers. And I was basically thinking about them as teenagers and their interests. And I had this huge space in the town. And somehow, I'm not quite sure how, we managed to get loans from the Tate Huge loans, as you can see here. This is our advertising on the street. This is the, literally, it's like a pub advertising. It says, Unconvention, Francis Bacon, Andy Warhol, Picasso, Edouard Munch, and more. And um, we had major works by these artists amongst political work f to do with the Spanish, uh, the Spanish Civil War, the Vietnam War. All of these things had particular resonance for the band because they'd written about them or spoken about them or referenced them in some way. So it was really like taking a teenage bedroom and then, you know, when you cut out pictures from magazines or art books and then making it real and putting it in a gallery. And this, so this, this uh, section is about the Spanish Civil War with posters, uh, Republican posters in the background and then material about the Welsh contribution to the Spanish Civil War. A lot of, a lot of miners went out and fought with the, for the Republican cause. We had a very big Andy Warhol self-portrait in the middle of the room. I'm going to talk a little bit about Warhol later. And uh, a, a book table and so on. And this is just some of the people that turned up. This is just an, an average day, basically. Um, I thought it was good to have Warhol in the middle because Warhol really is a meeting place. And I wanted the gallery to be a meeting place. In the way, the factory was a meeting place for lost souls, almost. And a band can have that effect on young people. A band and its culture is also a meeting place. So. I felt the two things for me work quite well. Um, this has nothing to do with that show. I'm sort of racing through things, but this is at the same time I was putting together a collection and an exhibition about British folk art. Um, as, as is the case with a lot of things, you do things that many projects happen at the same time, and this was literally at the same time. That show was a traditional art exhibition in Wales. This was a less so. That show was about putting things you'd see in a museum together in, in the same place, but maybe in a slightly different, with a slightly different motivation. This exhibition and uh, collection was really a way of forwarding and, and uh, pinpointing things in visual culture, basically folk art and vernacular art that myself and my colleague Alan Kane were very excited by and which we felt had influenced performance art, influenced contemporary art, but also showed that art was not just the domain of artists. And the art world in London, which seemed to get all the attention, probably wasn't deserving of all that attention because people were being creative way outside London and doing amazing things. So example, I'm going to show you a few examples. This is um, called the World Gurning Championship. And uh, like a lot of contemporary art, really, no one really knows why someone, people do this. With a lot of folk art, the traditions are so old that the meaning of them and the derivation has been lost. So people just make up meanings and they have their own traditions and their own ideas about these traditions. So this is a competition where you have to make yourself as ugly as possible without touching your face. So you have to pull a face and, and keep it for like 10 seconds. And also, if you want, you can have this yoke put around you, this leather, leather collar, which you'd put on an animal, and you can behave like an animal. And uh, it's been going on for nearly maybe a thousand years in this area. And so every year, it's the biggest thing that happens in the, in, the, in, the, in the town. This happens. One year, the first year we went, the guy that lost, like the local hard man, you know, every village has a local hard guy, 
he came second and he started uh, crying on stage, basically. And the following year he won because he had a dentist take all his teeth out <laughs> so he could make the, po the correct ugly pose. So that's the sort of dedication that not, you know, most artists wouldn't go to that, those lengths to do something like that. So we, another thing about this is it's an inversion of what's, what is normal, what's acceptable, and it's a, and sort of anarchic as well. So this is the opposite of a beauty contest, and it's an ugly contest. And so as to artists, for myself for my, and Alan, my friend, this kind of thing instinctively attracts, is attractive to us. Um, danger, chaos, anarchy, bad behavior, all these things are things that we like. This is a tar barrel rolling competition where it starts in the afternoon on the 5th of November, and it starts with children, literally children, five, six-year-old boys and girls with a, a burning barrel on their back running through the town. And then as the day goes on, people get older, and at the end, uh, with, the, with the last barrel, called the midnight barrel, which is the size of a small car, and with all the men of the town parading it through on fire. Um, super dangerous, but a lot of fun. Um, and again, the, the meaning of it has been lost through the mists of time. But, like, you know, it's kind of, like I said, like contemporary art, it's sort of meaningless, but very meaningful at the same time. So we loved all of this kind of thing. And of, often you find the further away from London you go, the more extreme the performances are. So this is a long way from London, it, both in terms of distance, but also in culturally it's a long way from London, and in terms of how people are as well. This is another beautiful thing, it's called the Berry Man. So for a whole day, a man is covered in these spiky uh, burrs, they're called, from a, from a plant, and he parades through a town, sort of psycho, this kind of weird psychogeography. But you can see now, when you look at this, you see how this relates to other cultures around the world, but also how contemporary art could look at things like this and think, actually, this is not bad for a, I could do this for a performance for my degree show or something like that. And so we, in a way, we were, we were saying it was a challenge. Our exhibition was really a challenge. Well, I've lost the next image. That's a pity. The, the exhibition is big, and it's uh, hundreds of photographs. It's banners, trade union banners. It's lots of objects. And uh, it was, weirdly, uh, it's, it was bought by the British Council, which is the official British sort of government body almost to promote Britain's culture abroad. And it's just, this whole exhibition is just toured India, which is for me, it was a great achievement really to get this view of Britain abroad. Because I think, you know, in, in a lot of people's minds, Britain is really one kind of thing. It's like the Queen, and now it's the Queen and Downton Abbey, and maybe One Direction. But actually, it's a lot of other things, a lot of things I, potentially a lot more interesting and a lot more anarchic. Um, and people tend to forget there's that side to British culture. There's the sort of authoritarian side and the class side, but that has, the, and the other side of that though is a sort of chaos and uh, love of danger and misbehavior. And that's what I was hoping to show, or we were hoping to show in this exhibition. Just the kind of view, our, our view of the country basically. Um, I've, been in, I've been interested in, well, I, I, as an artist, you get asked to do a lot of things. You get asked to put on exhibitions and curate shows, and I was asked to, to, do a, uh, to curate an exhibition of whatever I wanted to do, more or less, a few years ago. And I've, had, I've been obsessed, really, with um, learning about the Industrial Revolution, but also Britain's how it affected Britain. Britain was the first industrial nation. It was the first nation to urbanize. By the middle of the 19th century, over half the population of Britain were living in cities, which is many years ahead of most other countries. And that's affected us as a country. It's made us, our, our, it's affected our relationship to the countryside, but also our, our relationship to folk culture. So the folk culture I was just showing you for a long time, until quite recently, has actually been denigrated by the media in Britain. It was seen as not worthy or as stupid, or the people that did it were backward, because in a way we'd lost this connection to the countryside and we couldn't work out how we related to it. So I made an exhibition about our relationship to industry and looked at the Industrial Revolution, the, the, the visual quality of the Industrial Revolution, how it was interpreted by artists, but also by um, what I'd call folk culture and that maybe how that had an impression upon us now and how that affected us. 
So I did this exhibition, and uh, I'll just show you some, some images from that. And again, I was taking artworks, like with the work in Cardiff, very traditional museum objects and artworks, but just put it, giving them a slight twist. Maybe that's what artists are there for, to take, give things a twist or a certain element of risk in a way that a traditional curator, I hate, hate to give you that term, traditional curator, but maybe a professional curator might find more difficult. So in a way, for museums and galleries, you're used as a sort of um, research and development in terms of what's possible, what are the limits, if there are any, in terms of putting on exhibitions. So for example, this room had a jukebox and with this big, it's not really an explosion, it's meant to look like something out of the process of making steel. And in the middle, the records in the jukebox, most of them were just sounds of industry. So sounds of mills, sounds of uh, coal mining, glass making and, st and the steel production. And, it was and it's called Factory Records, which anyone who knows about British music industry will realize what I'm getting at there. And this was just a way of really, a really kind of stupid, explicit way of making a connection between the sounds of industries and the sounds made by popular culture in terms of music, the music industry. And the music industry in Britain traditionally has been based in towns all the best music has basically been based in towns with an industrial, post-industrial history, more or less post-industrial now. And so if you think about Manchester and um, Liverpool, Sheffield, Leeds, Newcastle, they all, they all have music scenes, but actually those music scenes are quite specific. So for example, the Manchester music scene is, is based around, a sort of vaguely around dance music, and then you hear the sound of the mills, and it's a much more percussive, danceable sound. I mean, literally. Whereas if you go to Newcastle, or you have a shipbuilding, or the steel industry, it's a heavier sound for those industries, but also the music is a lot heavier. So I was trying to make this comparison in, peop in people's minds. It's something that is spoken about a lot. And as you can see, just on those small framed works there, these were really the earliest pieces of pop music made in Britain. They're called broadsides, and they were sold in the streets, and they were songs about love. A lot, a lot of the time, they were songs about people coming from the countryside to the cities. So they're very, very explicit songs, really, about the experience of living in cities for the first time and what it was doing to people and how it was making people urban. You know, these were the first or second generations of people having to live around thousands of other people for the first time in British history, almost. So these are their songs about that. And a lot of songs are written about the experience of work and what work was like. And they're actually incredibly they're done in a very raw folk style and um, they're not really folk music really because it's an urban kind of folk music so we had those as next to them and also a series of photographs an amazing series of photographs taken in the 1860s of women workers in wales in an iron factory well i, I don't it's not really a factory is it sort of iron works these are women that would be breaking the rocks outside so it's appalling work and a whole series of photographs of these women taken in a, what was, looks like a, a sort of a middle class style photographer's studio. So they were taken, all, all the backdrops were taken to the factory and these women were photographed. And we're not even sure why this happened, but there are stories about certain men of a kind of certain class or upper class or upper middle class who, had a, who were obsessed with working women and what they looked like. And so it, was, it, it, might, have, so it might have even had this sort of sexual element to them. But um, as you can see, uh, a lot of the women were just wearing rags. So these, these photographs were, were in these rooms as well. Just in case people try to romanticize the Industrial Revolution, which is probably the best idea not to. It's a more traditional uh, photograph, really. On the left, you have a John Martin painting. John Martin was, uh, did these huge, epic paintings. This is the flight from Sodom and Gomorrah, it's the destruction of the city. Um, he did these, so he did these huge scenes, often Old Testament scenes of destruction, of heaven and earth and hell. Very, very popular during the Industrial Revolution. Um, and what's interesting about Martin was that also at the same time he was making these paintings, he was trying to work out ways of taking sewage out of London, work out ways of uh, preventing gases, making gases leave coal mines. So he was absolutely obsessed with health, the health and safety of the industrial worker, but also how cities were working. And so these paintings of destruction of Old Testament cities, are, I would 
I would argue, are really about his own anxieties about the destruction of the Victorian city through diseases, mainly cholera, which had wiped out tens of thousands of people in London just when he was doing these pictures. So on the left, you have this apocalyptic scene. And on the right, if, if, uh, you can see that large frame photograph, another apocalyptic scene. It's the Amazon, one of the Amazon fulfillment centers in the, in the Midlands with this huge um, perspectival view of this almost endless uh, warehouse, like the biggest building in Britain or something like that. Um, because often when you see views of uh, factories, they have these very strong perspectives, these engravings often, that seem to go on forever. Um, and they, and they the size of the factory is often exaggerated. But here we have now with these, these Amazon uh, factories, like a proper, proper giant uh, fulfillment centers. So I was just making these very, in a way, very obvious comparisons, but, but how the, the visual language had, had remained, really. Again, this is about, this is a three, three items here. The one on the right is a clocking on, uh, clocking on clock that every, every factory had. So there's thousands of these in, in the storerooms of uh, industrial museums. You can't move for these clocking on clocks because that was how you knew if someone was coming in and how much were they going to get paid. And on the left, it's a, again, it's the Amazon Fulfillment Center, and it's just a big life-size cutout of one of the staff with all these quotes around him saying how amazing it is to work for Amazon. And in the middle, an amazing little watercolor of the factory boss asleep. You can't really tell, but it's this very subversive watercolor of a, like an overweight factory boss asleep with people working outside. This goes with the Amazon photographs and was hung with the Amazon photographs. It's actually what a lot of people, maybe not anymore, but a couple of years ago were working at Amazon. If you worked at Amazon, you wore one of these around your wrist and it, it's a stock control thing. So you sort of scan the barcode on the object that you're taking. Uh, because you're being given instructions by this, by this machine, by this device, but also you, the device would track you and it would track your work rate, and if you weren't working quickly enough, it would send you messages and tell you to hurry up. So it was a very straightforward piece of equipment um, to keep track on the worker. I'm just gonna have a bit of water. I just finished a show in Oxford. So this is the exhibition that's, that's most on my mind. It was a, it's, a, it's an exhibition about Andy Warhol and William Morris. William Morris being the arts and crafts uh, philosopher and uh, genius. Very psychedelic there. Now, I don't know what I've done. Maybe I'll do that. So you can't come back. Is anyone here with tech? Oh, there we go. I feel like I shouldn't even touch this. So, I, so it's an exhibition about Warhol and Morris, who you might not think have anything in common at all. Whereas I actually think they're both very similar artists. They're both artists that uh, had their own empires, basically, as artists. But also, we're, we're working within the empire of the day, the dominant empire of the day, i.e. the British Empire, the mid to late Victorian era, and then the American Empire, post-war. And in a way, Warhol was documents the American Empire, I would argue. And I just felt they had so much in common. Not just that, but also uh, the way they look at mythology, their interest in mythology. Both of them from childhood were obsessed by um, mythical places, one being Camelot, for Morris, who's obsessed with the knights, knights of King Arthur, and Lancelot, and so on. Warhol, obsessed with Hollywood. And these interests remained with them to their dying day. I mean, right to the end, Morris was making some of his most spectacular works based on those, those mythologies. So I wanted to show that comparison. So I had a section called Camelot, which of course also refers to Kennedy. Um, so there's a section with Kennedy, and the, because the Kennedy presidency was called Camelot. Also, I was very interested in putting uh, these works on Morris wallpaper. I think it was, for me, it was an essential part of the exhibition. 
I'll just go back to this one image. There's a very interesting. This is on the on the on the left. You can just see that small framed image. That is a signed photograph to Warhol when he was 13 from Shirley Temple, and he kept this uh, separate from all the other signed photographs he was sent. He was sent hundreds because as a child, like with William Morris as a child, they both were quite sick as children, so they spent a lot of time by themselves just creating their own worlds, almost literally. And, when, and of course, when they grew up, they literally did create their own worlds. And so that's a photograph, a signed photograph of Shirley Temple. And as you can see, uh, what's so striking really is that that image of Shirley Temple and the image of Marilyn, this is a, a Marilyn rug that was made uh, in the 60s, are actually very, very similar. They both are hand, the, the uh, Shirley Temple is hand colored. The, the, uh, the pose is very similar to Marilyn. So to me, seeing that image of Shirley Temple made me realize how the sincerity in Warhol. We all assume he's one of the most shallow, ironic artists, but actually I find him a very sincere artist. This was the Camelot uh, moment for Morris. So this was in the room with, oh, facing Marilyn. I wanted, his port I wanted Warhol's, Warhol's portraits of women, mainly, to face this which again is this mythical scene of, of heroic men and beautiful women, which again was something that Warhol was obsessed with throughout his whole life. Um, and this is part of a tapestry of, uh, called The Attainment of the Grail. It's a seven-part tapestry series that was still being made when, when Morris died, and it's really his masterwork. Of course, when you think about it, Morris and uh, Warhol both had a very intense studio practice, and their studio practice, as I'll talk about in a minute, was, is, was a very important part of the show because they both expressed their ideas about the world through how they worked with other people and, and the way they organized their studio. But I'll just carry on a little bit more beyond that. I was also interested in the, the political element to Warhol and Morris. One section of the show was about politics because, of course, Morris was one of the first socialists in Britain. He actually ran a party for a while, the Hammersmith Socialists, and wrote extensively about art and its relationship to society, um, art colleges, the coming revolution, which he really believed was going to come uh, in the last years of his life. Um, he's one of the most prolific Victorian writers, as well as being one of the most prolific Victorian designers and uh, thinkers. And I was very keen to have what I considered very political work by Warhol with Morris's political work, because again, Warhol often is misunderstood, I feel is misunderstood in terms of his political beliefs and uh, expressions, especially the late work in the 80s is full of politics, it's full of de death and destruction and foreboding. Um, on the left of Morris's uh, drawings, these are drawings he did for the Royal family and also the Vanderbilt family. So Morris, like Warhol, was very interested in power and money and was always around it. He never stopped being around it. He was working for the richest people in the world, as was Warhol. And so he gained his knowledge of, of corruption and wealth through, through proximity to it, as did Warhol. If you read Warhol's diaries and his writings about the wealthy, he's actually quite uh, rude about them and rude about people's taste and how they look, as was Morris. I mean, Morris would argue with clients to their faces, telling them what terrible taste they had when he went around their houses and, and saw all the, all, the, all the sort of corrupting art and design they had. So I felt that they, they both were quite similar in their slightly cynical view of, uh, of, of wealth and the corrupting view of wealth. Again, talking about this idea of the studio and how you organize your production and how important that is to how you believe the world should be organized. Morris believed in a medieval view of the craftsman and how the craftsman should, should uh, people should get uh, value from their work and enjoyment from their work, which you know is something at the time was probably unthought of, but now this is something we all think about, the quality of life. And he was definitely saw that as being integral to the quality of the work you make and what you do at work. Likewise, Warhol, he set up a, a, a way of working that now we take for granted. If you go to any tech company or any advertising agency, they're try really basically trying to, to, to to remake the model that was the factory in the 60s, in a sense. They're trying to have this very, a place where there's a lot of work is being done, a lot of things are being done, but it seems quite casual and social, people dropping in and out. There's you know, spaces where people can play, but actually there's a, there's a very, very strong work ethic. Warhol was one of the hardest working artists, even though he never gave you an impression that he was working. 
he was never off, really. So in this, in this exhibition, we had a section about money and about commerce, about shops. Morris had a, a shop in London. It was opposite Selfridges, which is the biggest department store in London. He was out there. He was, even though he's, the main criticism of Morris is that he was, he was a sellout because he, he was talking about the working man, but actually he was making work for expensive people, uh, ex expensive work for rich people. And so I felt that was actually very unfair. He was just trying to make make things of beauty that gave people satisfaction to make, but also to look at. Also, you have that idea that he, when, he does, when he was making someone's, uh, decorating someone's mansion, they were actually working for him. He wasn't working for them. Morris wasn't working for the rich person. The rich person was actually working for William Morris. He, he, they were helping William Morris uh, make something of beauty that he wanted to do for himself. It was like always his project. Of course, a show about these two artists has to have within it a room of, for me, it had to have a room that was purely about visual delight, about decoration, about promiscuity, really. They were both very promiscuous artists. They were multimedia artists, artists that were not content with, with doing one thing in their careers. As we know, Morris did everything from writing a play and a recipe book to running a political party and everything in between. If Morris was around now, he would be designing, or he would probably be running Apple and running a political party. If you, I read something about um, Jonathan Ive recently, and it's very interesting because Morris not only wanted to make things that look good, but things that were well made, but also he wanted to understand every part of the process of production so he could master the, the production as well. And if you and the thing about Jonathan Ive, the designer for Apple, it's a very similar. Uh, very similar uh, way of working, the way that they designed the components as well as the shell for something, and then uh, for a computer or a phone, and then also they designed the software. Morris was definitely that, you know, it was an actually vertical integration of, of, as a designer. So we had this room about repetition, about colorways, about uh, how you take, make a design and then you do all these different things with it, um, with scale and so on. And it was meant to be a room of delight, of, in a sense, like I said, a very promiscuous room because of their promiscuous careers, but also kind of sexual, almost a sexual room as well, because there's just so much reproduction in it. So there's a lot of Warhol drawings, and these very erotic drawings he made in the 50s of flowers with young men and with shoes and so on. They're very, very quite odd, poignant drawings he was making when he's having these drawing parties in his, in his uh, house. That might be my talk. Have I, have I talked for too long? No. Is that all right? Okay. So yes, I mean, in a way, so it, it, I was just trying to look at these two men, really, and see what they had in common, because you'd expect them to have nothing in common, because one seemed to have these great principles as a socialist, and the other one, all, all he was interested in was money. And that's, these are the sort of very simple sort of uh, d definitions of these two artists. But I felt they were both probably I would argue that William Morris is a more important artist than Turner and Constable. Um, his influence is by far greater than any other Victorian British artist, if not any artist of that century. And likewise with Warhol. Warhol owned the last half of the 20th century, I agree. I would, um, I would agree myself. I would, I would argue, and um, just as the legacy for, you know, for Morris, the legacy for him was modernism, and for Warhol, it's really the internet. So they both were looking, you know, their legacy is something we still live with. We both live in worlds that they help create, which is very unusual for an artist. So I wanted to show them as brothers, effectively, through centuries, even though they would never have met or never been close to meeting. And quite interestingly for me, which I even liked even more, even though Warhol was this collector of everything, he had only one thing of William Morris in his, uh, in his uh, collection, which was a book that he bought a year before he died. So he, it's as if Warhol didn't even know about William Morris, but he was taught at a university that was based on a William Morris um, template for art colleges, of, that you teach people a number of disciplines, not just one, and they try and master those disciplines. So in a sense, he was sort of a child of, of Morris, if that's not a weird thing to say at the end of a talk, but that's how I saw it. So I haven't really talked much about curating and my ideas around curating, but 
as an artist, if you, I've, I was brought up as a, I should say brought up, I, I went to the Courtauld Institute, and so I, I'm basically trained as an art historian, um, but I'm a lapsed art historian, obviously. After I left the Courtauld, I couldn't go into art galleries for about four or five years, because I felt so ashamed that I hadn't worked in a museum or an auction house, and I felt I couldn't really face it. But um, I don't have any fear of museums. I don't have any fear of collections of museums or curators. I mean, quite the opposite. As a child, I was taken around lots of museums, so I feel very much at ease in museums, and I kind of understand, I think I understand the culture of them and the look of them, and so I have a, a confidence, in a sense, looking at things and putting things together. And for me, the great joy of a museum is actually the backstage, as it were, as, as I will call it, where you can look at everything on the racks and just pull things out. And in a sense, that what, that's what this project is I'm doing here. I should really talk about that as well. Um, it, it's about that. It's about the culture of museums and about the, the reserve collection, as I will call it, the collections you don't see, and being able to handle those things. So when I go to a museum backstage, I can handle things, which I love. And so with this project here that I've done, um, I've, in a way, given the given a little bit of that experience to people in unlikely environments. That's basically what I wanted to do. I wanted to juxtapose a hand axe in a shopping center and maybe what that connection is to hold a hand axe when you're in a shopping, your mind is in a shopping mind and there here you are holding this axe. What does that do to you? And what does that do to the environment that you're in? So it's a very simple thing really, um, trying to create these tensions almost between an object and an environment. Anyway, thank you. I think that's it.